Thank you for auditing the always positive new music review show hosted by a French professor who's going to be talking about the new Vampire Weekend album, despite the fact that, let's go back in time. Let's go back in time to March 2024. If you asked me all the way back then, a couple weeks ago, hey Sky, are you a Vampire Weekend fan? I would have said this. <sighs> Not really. I I don't go for the whole millennial woo-woo. I don't go for the whole prep school thing. I don't know. It's just not for me. I'm, I'm sure there's good stuff about them, but I just don't like them. Fast forward to now. <laughs> I bought the, the deluxe indie exclusive vinyl. I got the poster framed back there. I've become a fan. And I want to talk about how did I get from there to here with Only God Was Above Us, an early contender for the album of the year, definitely. Now, what did I know about Vampire Weekend before this? Um, I remember playing the video game Just Dance and uh, their, tra their song A-Track, A-Punk, A-Frame, A-Something is like the doo 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 hey, 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 hey. and that was, that was a very good Just Dance song. That was about it. I know that uh, the main guy, Ezra, worked on the last Phoenix album, and I love Phoenix. I know that Rostam Batman Yilyi worked with Carly Rae Jepsen. That was about it. I mean, I knew they were like prep school kids who met at NYU or Columbia, or one of those stupid New York stories. And a lot of my anger, well, I have a lot of anger about what's happened to the East Coast, the United States of America. It's nice because I now live in the snow belt of, of Western New York, where a lot of those things uh, that I regret have not hit as hard. But just the overall gentrification of the East Coast, the invasion of scientists, uh, you know, wealthy, wealthy entrepreneurial scientists and investment bankers and all that, sort of transforming New York. But I'll talk more about that. But I sort of saw them as like the face of the new New York, not the one that I remember from growing up in the 80s and the 90s, uh, but the one that is there now, the M&M store in Times Square. And that's sort of more generalized, just generalized disagreement. So part of this channel, if you're just here because you see this is a long review about an album that you like, just come along with me. Because if you love Vampire Weekend and you're trying to figure out how come some older people don't like them, I gotta tell you, as a Generation Xer, they were one of those bands that I just, I felt mad at. I mean, I felt mad at the Strokes as well, but at least the Strokes were my generation playing for the next generation. You know, that's usually how it works, right? Kurt Cobain was a boomer. It's true. Technically, he was. Or a very, very early extra. But in general, right? But these guys, Vampire Weekend, they are millennials singing for millennials. And whatever weirdly corrupted influence I had, whatever kind of weird anger I had at growing older 15, 20 years ago, whenever it was that Vampire Weekend came out, I really put into disliking their music. I did give them a chance in 2019 with the album Father of the Bride, and for some reason I had a violent, angry, negative reaction. Please understand, I'm going to revisit it. It's probably better. I looked at my notes and I actually started the review, but I got to, I think, the fourth song called This Life, and just the way that he pronounced the words California, it's just, I was like, what is this, Californication? And so I just said no. So imagine my surprise, surrounded by the Vampire Weekend exclusive poster, the vinyl. Imagine my surprise when <laughs> this album is so good. Now listen, I don't know how long this is going to be. I don't do I don't do edits, so I don't know how long my videos are. I don't know how long I'm going to be talking. the The eclipse is about to happen really soon, right here. I'm right on the hundred percent totality. It's cloudy as hell, so I'm not going to see anything, but that's cool. You know, how, how did I get to this point where I'm going to be talking about this album for at least a half an hour, <laughs> going from where I was disliking them? Well, first of all, my initial take that these are just the strokes, but millennial, maybe, I may want to correct that. Instead of saying it like this, they're just the millennial strokes. Say it like this, they are the millennial strokes. 
like a positive thing to say. Yes, they are a result of the changes of New York City and all these transformations and all that, but also the Strokes are an awesome rock band that I discounted because when they came out, I was 25 as opposed to 15. If they came out when I was 15, then they would be my future. I would be Shia LaBeouf running through the suburbs with my Strokes t-shirt, okay? So maybe they really are, or, or maybe, they are American Phoenix. You know, maybe that actually works. Now that's a very high compliment. I'm not gonna give them American Phoenix yet. So, so that's why I have the new Abnormal back here because this is actually what it reminds me the most of. And it's not that it sounds the same, but the same kind of feeling of discovery of just like, oh my God, it's, you just, you get so, <laughs> you know how they said the older you get, the wiser you get? They don't talk about the adolescence of wisdom where, there's like a middle period in your 20s and early 30s where you just get rigid as hell and your thinking gets totally stuck and you get really, 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 really stupid. Most people stay that stupid and then become conservative dweebs. Some people are able to get past that and see their own flaws and grow and that's how you become actually wise. Well, the new abnormal was my indication that the Strokes were not just some okay band, that they were a truly great rock band and this album, Only God Was Above Us, is making me realize, wow, Vampire Weekend is really it. I like to talk about my experience listening to the music because uh, I'm, I'm a part-time music cricket, right? I'm a full-time French professor, that's what I do. So I have to fit music into my life. And the way that I listen to music can tell me a lot about it. You hear my baby crying, right? Downstairs. My wife's trying to get her to be quiet, but we don't care. We like the baby crying, right? Tell me in the credits, tell me in the description if you like the baby crying. So that's my real life. So the first listen was actually while my wife was napping up here in the I Theodore uh, studio. And, uh, and my wife was napping, so I listened to this album very quiet, and I was sitting on the couch. And I was like, oh wow, hey, I can't hear it that well, but I think this might rule. And then she came downstairs, and I listened to it louder in that same living room, on a little Bluetooth speaker, my little JBL, big red speaker, you know, very cool, listen to it louder, start dancing with my baby. Well, my baby's not crying, she's dancing. She loves dancing, we're dancing. It's a very danceable album, a very enjoyable dancing. And then I get my first official listen. So that's where I go to the gym. The way that I listen to music is I put on a movie on mute, I get on the elliptical, and I listen to the album, and I take notes in the notes app, okay? So I happen to be watching The Ruins, a horror movie from the 2000s. It's actually a pretty millennial horror movie. It wasn't a bad pairing. And that's where I took all my notes. And at this point, I'm just like, I cannot believe how good this album. Like each time I listen to it, I am more surprised at the production level, at the songwriting level, at the cohesion of the vision, at the joy of it, at the consistency of it. The worst song on this album is a good song. Unlike, uh, what was it, Requiem for the Mets? Strokes fans are still pissed at me. They will come back to that video and be like, bro, Requiem for the Mets is the, oh, to the Mets, is still the best song on the album. I just don't like that song that much. Then I listen to it again while making pancakes with my baby. I make pancakes on Sundays for my family. And there we're just really going. Then I go right to Record Archive after breakfast on Sunday. It's packed because everyone's in town to see the clouds. And, uh, and there it was, I got the last copy of it on vinyl. And then I bring it home and I put it on my hi-fi with the big speakers and the Macintosh components. And oh my God, all the way through, quiet, loud, car, home, everywhere you go, everywhere you listen to it. There, there's something about this album which is sometimes gets lost with some of the more indie projects that I review, which I love, the indie projects. But much like the new Abnormal, Vampire Weekend is like, screw it. We are rock stars. We are major label musicians, and we are going to put out a major label album. We're gonna drip out a couple songs. We're gonna have the, the vinyl available in stores when it actually comes out, not three weeks later when it could be pressed somewhere in Croatia, okay? No, we're actually going to release this album, and it has that great big feeling, and it can fill up a house. It's the production that really steals the show here. It's produced by the main guy, Ezra Koenig, I hope I'm pronouncing it properly, and Ariel, and I'm only going to say his last name once. I believe it's Recht Said. <laughs> I don't, it's like German Arabic names. Like Recht sounds very German, and then Said sounds Arabic. So I don't know how to pronounce it. And in that way, it makes me happy that I'm not a Vampire Weekend fan. Because if I were, 
I would be really invested, I imagine, in the history of the band. Like Rostam Batmanyu isn't on here at all. Nowhere. And, and the, the bass player, Bayo, he's here. I don't know if he's... Please, please tell me he's way to Scott Bayo. That'd be the greatest law blog you could ever tell me. And then the drums are someone named Chris Thompson. But like, the amount of times... <laughs> to use the parlance of our times, the amount of times that the drummer gets cucked on this album, <laughs> someone else playing drums, it makes me feel bad. Because he's a great drummer. I mean, he's... I mean, based on what I've heard, he's part of the soul of the group. But this does feel like a Vampire Weekend album, the same way that Pet Sounds is a Beach Boys album. Like, this is the Ezra and Ariel show, and I think that's fine, because it's just so good. And whoever the hell this guy is, who it turns out, he's married to Rashida Jones. So that's, you know, that's cool. She's like one of my favorite actresses. That's, yeah, I don't really believe in the whole like celebrity crush thing. Uh, but she's probably, if I did, she, she'd be up there. And that's cool. They're happily married. And that's weird because then also the lead singer of Phoenix is happily married to Sofia Coppola. It's like Sofia Coppola and, and, and uh, Rashida Jones, sort of like famous daughters of really powerful and problematic men, some more than others, uh, yeah, married to rock stars in an era that deprioritizes rock and roll. It's all kind of there. There's something about the vocal production all the way throughout that's just so good. It's like his voice can be distant and engaging. And I was trying to think of more comps. Like, what does this make me think of? Imagine if Jeff Tweedy of Wilco were not cripplingly depressed. <laughs> that's all. I don't know why that might seem like the wackest comparison I could make. So whack that saying the wackest is not as whack as that comparison is. But to me, it makes sense. Tell me in the comments if that resonates. And the idea of mixing classical instruments with rock and roll is always dicey. It's a very, very fine line. And they do it so well. It's like, it feels like every single song was orchestrated with a symphony and then every once in a while, uh, Ariel and Ezra would be there in the mixing board and just be like, oh, right, we have a, okay, there's some strings, uh, there's some horns, okay, take them out. Used very sparingly, always emotionally powerful. The other thing about this album, you know, like this album, it feels like an album. Just a, you know what I'm saying? It's not just like a series of thoughts or whatever. It's like a real album. It's kind of a, excellent sequencing that's even playful at times. And this is just something I noticed. There's a song that sounds like a surf song that comes after a song called Surfer. There's a song that has a very classical uh, piano interlude that comes after a song called Classical. I don't know. Speaking of musical interludes, every single song has what I am going to refer to as a nim, a nutty instrumental moment. Some moment where Ezra and Ariel, Ariel and Ezra, Anakin and Obi-Wan, where they get together and they just say, okay, this song's been good, but what if we put something in there that's like super hard for Sky to explain, but he'll try his absolute best to describe the musical things that are happening here. But I love that about, about music played by live instruments, played by people who are actually playing music. I love techno, I love electronic music too. But there's something about the energy and the love and the passion that comes through in these instrumental bits. So I'm going to be pointing out some instrumental nuttiness. Also, many songs, I think, pair. Why did I say that so strong? Pair. <clears throat> I'm also, I'm, I'm leaning my hand on my baby's crib over here. That's when I'm going like this. That's what I'm doing. Hey, ladies. Uh, so when I'm, uh, I'll be making odd pairings between songs on this album and other songs in music history. So, you know, so I think it sounds like, you know, Wilco minus depression. It sounds a lot like the new abnormal to me, just in the sense of it being a monumental rock album in the 2020s. Or is that 2019? No, it's 2020s. In the 2020s. But the album it reminds me most of is maybe my favorite album I've ever reviewed, at least in terms of how my family has, has reacted to it. That is My Finest Work Yet by Andrew Bird back there. There's been a lot of talk about, based on what I've read, okay, listen, there's been a lot of talk. I've read like two articles about this album, but it seems like a lot of focus is on New York and the nature of New York and love letters to New York, and I hate love letters to New York. Love letters to LA, fine, but love letters to New York, 
ah, I can't stand them for that very reason that I was talking about. But I actually think it's not just New York. I think that they, the lyrics here are largely about a sense of loss. And it's not just the loss of New York City and the way that it is now versus the way that it used to be. It's the loss of America. It's the loss of civility in public discourse. It is the result of what I have referred to as COVID-16. 2016 is the year, based on my experience, when the world lost its goddamn mind, where human beings lost the battle with technology. That's where we lost. That was where, if we look back, we don't need to wait for Cyberdyne. We don't need to wait for the T-1000. It was like a couple weeks on Facebook, and that was basically it. <laughs> and that was probably the end of our civilization is going to be a result of that kind of inflection point in 2016. That's the rise and reform reinforcement of totalitarianism and all sorts of uh, divisive rhetoric and all that stuff. It's just anyways. And so my finest work yet has this perspective, which I think is echoed in Only God Was Above Us, where they're not sitting there saying, can you believe Orange Man did bad? And nor is it saying, can you believe Orange Man is good? It's more like, Look at what's going on, everybody. We need an artist to try to explain this moment, this moment of loss and change. Like, people are just so freaked out. And, and like, they just need to just let go. They just need to just be free of all this. They just need to stop fighting. The enemy is invincible, and I hope we can all let it go. So I'm gonna be returning to these themes a lot because it's an important and interesting position to take. This guy, Ezra, is almost 40, I'm 46, so it is an important time in your life where you realize you're, <laughs> you're, part of the, you're part of the old people, not a part of the young people, and the distance that you take and he's taking on here. But that's not to say it's not about New York. I mean, you know, this, this picture here, uh, this alternate photo here, this photo on the back here, uh, this photo here, the official photo, which you'll see in my thumbnail here. It's all very well chosen. It's all very intentionally chosen. As coming from Stephen Siegel's series of photographs, Subway Dream. I'm going to take a little while to, to discuss this because... You know, again, it's fascinating. Like, they took Basquiat and he's taking this. Like, they're both trying to reference back to some kind of older New York phase. So, the Subway Dream series was shot in 1988 through 1990. Right near Liberty, Statue of Liberty, there was like a junkyard of old trains, old subway trains. So, why? Why would there be old subway trains? Well, because they'd be putting in new trains. When you see pictures of the old New York subway, it's all like this. It's all covered in graffiti, or as my son used to call it when he was a kid, graffiti. It's all covered in graffiti. It's all nasty and dirty and dark. And then here they are in the, in the waste yard. And it happened to be that most of the trains were tipped over, so that's how you could get these weird effects of looking like people are standing uh, on the walls, right? Or stand, right? But each one of these trains is a reminder of that real New York, the New York that existed before the wealth gap expanded to the point where the concentration of wealth in Manhattan and in most of New York City made the city unlivable and untenable as a place for people who are not hyper rich. Okay? So. <laughs> It's fascinating because these pictures were taken before the transformation, before the Giuliani transformation, before the influx of super wealth, which we'll be talking a fair amount about in this album. And, you know, this is like, <laughs> but it's being shown in 2024 by artists who I associate with the M&M store in Times Square. So when I talk about the M&M store, I remember going to Times Square for the first time. I'm from Boston, so I used to go to New York a fair amount. And it was in the 80s. And okay, yeah, there were porno theaters and peep shows. But I legitimately remember seeing somebody with a needle in his arm in Times Square getting off the subway. 
okay? That's what it was like. It really was like you see. It really was like you walked through New York City and you had Travis Bickle's monologue going on in your head. And I mean, that was worse in the 70s, according to all, all reports. But that's what they're calling back to. So it's funny that a group that met at Columbia Okay, one of the gentrifying forces of New York City is these big universities with their ridiculous endowments with a B, billions and billions and billions of dollars. Hey, everybody, please support public universities. Even if you don't go, don't give your money to Columbia. Give your, give your money to a SUNY or a CUNY, okay? Goddamn. Public universities are poor. Private universities are rich. Why is it? Prep school mafia. So uh, it's interesting to put it all in this place. And for me, it's, it makes it ambiguous because it's like the gentrifiers trying to remember what it was like before it was gentrified. But I want to be more generous to them and say that, that everybody gets to lament this time because even New York of 2010 isn't the same as New York of 2024. The title itself comes from the front, pa front pages of a newspaper from 1988, Only God Was Above Us, which is what someone said on Aloha Airlines Flight 243. The roof fell off of the airplane. Okay? I'm, I'm afraid of flying. Uh, most people who are raised by alcoholics are bad flyers because we don't trust people who are who are in charge of us okay so i'm i'm one of those guys right i have to i don't believe in drugs but i believe in the hell out of out of when i'm flying okay i didn't know roofs could fall off but that's what happened the good news is only one person died flight attendant fallen teamster um but still it's a fascinating idea and it's not like they could have possibly known that <laughs> that they'd be releasing this album and have the cover make reference to an airplane part falling off of an airplane. Oh, did I forget to mention? It was a Boeing. <laughs> it was a Boeing 737. So they released the album right as Boeing airplanes are literally just like flying off everywhere. And that happens to be the reference. So let's get into the album. I'll take a sip of my mug. You can buy this mug. You can buy a replica mug. It's my Professor Sky mug. There you go. This is also my water bottle, but I, I don't sell these water bottles, so I don't drink out of that. If you like this video, if you like what I'm doing here, smash the like bucket, subscribe. Uh, if you want to put in letters AVAA, that stands for awesome video as always, uh, I will heart that. It can even secretly mean ass video as always, and I'll still heart it. You can humiliate me by agreeing with you that my videos are bad. So let me give you an example song. And for that, I want to thank... Okay, <laughs> I, am the, I am so salty when I, there's an album that I want to buy and it's a double album. It's like, listen, man, I, I'm into vinyl. I like CDs, but I'm into vinyl too. And, but don't make me flip the album four times. So this is a double vinyl. And side four is just the last song, Hope. And I actually like this because I think Hope is the message of the album. I think it's the end. I think it is the final point. I think it is the thesis restated. I think it is sort of all of the songs mixed up into one to the point where it might be the same song as the song before it, Pravda. Super chunky, slightly distorted drums that pulsate forward. Occasionally these very satisfying double stutter step on the snare. The bass is very simple and very strong. You could sort of Think of this almost like a Sleeps With Angels era Neil Young song, just with this rhythm section, the great kind of junky simplicity, even the kind of plunky piano that comes in, nice haunting piano. This whole song is about resolution. It's resolving the album and all the notes just resolve. Da 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 I lost conviction I was gonna be able to land that ending. This great descending voice, all these horns get added, maybe like a melodium, I don't know. There is an instrumental nutty moment here as the rest of the album, a simple guitar solo that just, just goes with this like totally beautiful melodic piano line that's not the same as the main piano line. And they do so, so many times on this album where they could be like Instead, they just choose some kind of melodic hook 
almost like the way that um, My Bloody Valentine would, you know, where like in the back half of a song, I'll just like throw in an extra melody that they put in together and then that gets stuck in your head for the rest of your goddamn life. That's what makes this album so great is there's so many of these things. The song doesn't change much. There's a cool little descending melody that comes in with the bridge. Uh, it's, slight uh, change and otherwise very repetitive song. I do like that it gets noisy and epic at the end and you think it's over, like this feedback and the piano and then some ac acoustic guitar comes in to resolve the, the, the distorted guitar so you don't end on feedback, but it's not over. It comes back, returns to the verse, this time the electric guitar is on there, a little bit of feedback, more loud sounds, return to that beautiful, simple little new melody on the piano. Boom, dum, 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 dum. And then finally, they do that same fake ending again, except they really end it. And then we get to the lyrics. The thing about the thing, the thing about millennials is, uh, you know, you can tell a lot by like the presidents that people grew up with. You know, so I, I grew up with the Clintons and with Bush, right? Rough stuff. But hope is the Obama word. That's how he got elected. Hope and change, chop and hange, right? That's how he got elected. And I personally think Obama was a great president with many flaws. I personally think he was a great president, but not because of the hope bit, uh, because of a lot of the things that he did and a lot of the things that he tried to do but wasn't able to do because of our excellent system of checks and balances, which sometimes results in terrible, 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 horrible results. But this is that whole theme I'm talking about. Can we recover from COVID-16? All of these lyrics. The phoenix burned but did not rise. <sighs> okay, the phoenix is what is burned and then comes back to life. The phoenix burned but did not rise. Now half the body is paralyzed. There's no one left to criticize. I hope you let it go. Right? Like, I think this is about... Maybe about the South, the Civil War. I don't know about our how divided we are and unclear. And then it just repeats over and over again. I hope you let it go. Now, is that, that was the song from Frozen, right? And then we get this chorus that's repeated over and over and over again. The enemy is invincible. I hope you let it go. So you could look at this a couple ways. One, it's a centrist anthem everyone's crazy, just let it go, just try to go on, live your best life. Who cares if other people don't have autonomy over their own body? There's no need to do anything revolutionary. I don't think that's it, though. I think it's more about... So I grew up... Uh, my dad uh, was an interesting guy, and uh, he, he became a better father over time, but in the 80s, it was rough. And uh, he screamed at the television all the time. All the time. Like, any time... That wrinkly raisin 666 Ronald Reagan would get up on the TV, my dad would be screaming. It would like ruin my entire day. Like I lived my entire childhood just like terrified of watching Reagan. And I remember talking about this to a therapist and, and he described it as impotent rage. And I always think of that term whenever I think about basically anybody online talking about anything. Like they don't know that the enemy is invincible. And it doesn't matter who it is. If you're a right-wing conspiracy theorist and you believe the deep state is taking things over, it's invincible. If you are a left-wing, oh, I'm not gonna say a conspiracy theorist because most of the opinions held by the, the far left are mostly based in reality, just perhaps a bad way of approaching it. But whatever it is that you believe about injustice or whatever it is that you believe about systematic problems, we believe too much in our ability to change them. And we believe too much in the ability to change them by changing other people's beliefs, which leads us to attack each other, which then allows Facebook and the rest of the social media people to just monetize our disagreements. We're not moving forward in the way that we want to go. It's almost like uh, in recovery. People who've ever been through recovery, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, whatever it is, you have to realize you're powerless. The enemy is invincible. If we could just accept that, you know, like right now I'm thinking about the forces of free market capitalism and the way that they are destroying higher education, destroying my life as a public professor. It's invincible. Free market capitalism is invincible. And he hopes I let it go. 
I don't know. Maybe I'm putting words into his mouth. That's the way that I see it. How many, <laughs> you know, it starts off by saying that the, the U.S. Army has won the war, but we haven't won any wars because we keep fighting wars that can't be won. We can't win the war on drugs. We can't win the war on terror. We can't win the war for freedom. The prophet said we disappear. The prophet's gone, but we're still here. His prophecy was insincere. I like this because it reminded me of 2012 when we thought the world was going to end. And if you've never seen the comedy of Josh Johnson, I stumbled on him randomly. He's not like a super big comedian, but he's a working comedian. I'm sure he doesn't have another job, right? But he, yeah, he does a lot of work. A lot of his comedy is in this lane of sort of like, what the hell's going on now? Why is everything so kooky crazy? But he's even funnier than me, than the way I just said that. The embassy is abandoned now. The flag that flew is on the ground. The painting burned. The statue drowned. I hope you let it go. The moving train accelerates. It's always fast and always late. It never leaves the Empire State. I hope you let it go. Just everything here is about the freedom that comes from realizing you can't win these battles that are just unwinnable. And in that, maybe there's hope for some kind of personal peace. I'm going to go through the rest of the album now. A little bit quicker. Opening up with the track Ice Cream Piano. A little play on words. Reminded me of the, uh, what album was that? Where they did the same kind of play on words. It might have been the Everything Everything album. A very kind of Wilco-like start. Hey, this is the first pairing. There's a certain part of the song, which if you paired it with the theme song to the TV show Friends, it would work perfectly. I'll be there for you. Now that I've said it, hey, Vampire Weekend fans. You're sitting there and you're like, Sky, you're crazy, but now you're going to listen to the song and you're going to go, God damn, that professor, he found the, the, the Friends theme in there. It's just so well produced with these guitars and multiple voices. And then this lyric, which I swear to God, Andrew Bird heard this lyric and he was like, I should have written that. Impersonation of Andrew Bird in Fargo. You don't want to win the war because you don't want the peace. We're done. We're done. First song, we're done. First song, best lyric, set, we're all set. That hope thing, the end, it's all tied into this. The enemy is invincible. The enemy is invincible, let it go. And then beyond that, we don't want the peace, we want the war. And why do we want the war? Because people are so good at selling us the war. All of America wants Trump reelected, on some level. On some level, we all want the entertainment. We all want the war. We all want the fight. All of the media companies, everybody wins. Everybody wins except for the marginalized, except for the country, except for everything. We all lose, but we all win in the sense that we get to stay in the state of perpetual 2016. For some reason, we want to stay in 2016. Why do you want me to break your arm? Why are we stuck in this place? I don't know. But do we want the peace? November 2024. Okay, coming up. Let's say Trump loses by 80%. I don't know what percent it would take. Okay, whatever it is. Let's say there's some reptilian terrible part inside of us that doesn't want the peace. You wait for this big drop in the song. I remember listening to it when I was cooking with my baby and I'm sitting there, you know, or I'm sitting there and mixing together the ingredients and no, no drop. But then the drop comes on the second time you expect it. This great guitar with fuzz and then the nutty instrumental bit. These strings with these little like fun, fast melodies I'm talking about. They're like, they're sitting in the studio and like, oh, right, we have a, we have a whole like crazy violin thing here. But that's not even the nutty instrumental bit. That's the first nutty instrumental bit. Then we get this wow, 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 wow. It's so crazy and fun. And do you know what I started to say? Hey, 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 I remembered that song. A track. A pone. A punk. It might be a punk. It's either a track or a punk. And then it kind of slows down. Nice, kind of like awesome piano crash at the end. Then we get to the song, classical, upbeat guitar, acoustic, and then this very 90s drum loop. There's also a fair amount of 90s nostalgia in the, in the production here on this song, another song, Mary Boone. Uh, there's this kind of, what I guess I associate with Vampire Weekend, the sort of faux African style guitar, fast 
tasteful single notes that I could not play despite the fact that I'm a mediocre guitar player. This cool little like hook, little descending thing, but then it goes away for the verse because they give lots of space on this album to the singer. A great stand-up bass, I don't know if that's played by Scott Bayo, but then the little ditty comes back and it's almost like a jam style riff. <clears throat> and then you think you're all done. And then, here comes the Nim. The nutty instrumental moment, a saxophone solo. I typed in, who produced this? Ariel something. Wow. And then the acoustic bit comes back. And hey, did you notice there is in this song for seriously like four seconds, the bass line from Walk on the Wild Side? If you don't know, the way it's played is two basses at once, one going up, one going down at the same time. It was written by... Uh, um, a British uh, session musician who played on the album. I think that's kind of on purpose because Lou Reed is also a very old New York guy. He made the album called New York. He's sort of the face of New York. Never forget though, <laughs> never forget, Lou Reed is a suburban kid from Long Island who went to Syracuse University. So he's as much of a poser as anybody else. Uh, it kind of slows down and I was on the elliptical uh, when it slowed down and then I slowed down. And these are the most Andrew Birdie type lyrics because these are the kinds of questions that he's often asking. Like, what does it mean? What happens to history when it's rewritten? It's great because if you're an art historian like I am, or if you study music like I do, or if you study theater like I do, the term classical means something. It has meaning. It actually has a definition. And what I love about this is that it's emphasizing the movability of the term classic and of classical. We can refer to classical this, classical that, but it actually has a meaning. Its initial meaning is that it has to do with Greek and Rome, right? Like that's it, that's just it. If it's classical, it has to do with Greek and Rome. Over time, it became associated with any kind of art form that was emphasizing like grace, clarity, some kind of standardness to it, like classical theater in, in, in France has like a very lot of very rigid rules with a meter and how many acts and how many places it can be. But of course, when we talk about classical, the main thing we think of is music. And classical music is one of the most misused terms in the entire universe. You should be saying Western art music when you are referring to classical music. Now you say Western art music and you sound like a complete knob nod to my English viewers. You sound like a complete knob. More than that, you sound like a knob end. You sound like knob shite. That's how dumb you sound when you say Western art music. But the truth is, classical music was the late 18th, early 19th century. Beethoven was barely classical. Yeah, Mozart was. Bach wasn't classical. But now we just use that term for anybody. Anybody who would go to music, go to a school and play with a violin or a cello is a classical musician, which means that <laughs> classical music, which is partly based on the belief of harmony and balance, the term classical music is applied to avant-garde musicians who are explicitly anti-harmony and anti-balance. The meaning moves, and that's what Vampire Weekend is here to help us with, is what is classical. They make it clear that what is classical is based on who wins history, that the truth is classical, because classical is often seen as a search for perfection and truth. So it gets all sorts of class conscious here. In times of war, the, educa the educated class knew what to do. In times of peace, their, pu their pupils couldn't meet your baby blues. For 100 million animals competing in the zoo, it's such a bleak sunrise. Untrue, unkind, and unnatural, how the cruel with time becomes classical. So I think this is referring to the fact that often things that are classical come from a time of great hierarchy and division between people and people who had access to that which is classical are actually people at the top of the social hierarchy. Bridges burn and bodies break. It's clear that something's going to change and when it does, which classical remains? Perfect goddamn lyric. Is he always as good? God damn it. Is, is all of Empire Weekend this good? You can tell me now. You can tell me now, you can say, Sky, actually, they're really good. Father of the Bride is their best album ever. You totally missed the other album. You missed their collaboration with The Weeknd called Vampire Weekend. You know, 
And then we get to Capricorn, sloppy, awesome drum. I think the drums are the start of the song. I'm going to say it. I think the drums right here. Just bam. Awesome. All the way throughout. So well recorded. It's hard to record drums well, especially to get this feeling where it sounds clean but sloppy, you know? Re repetition over and over of you don't have to try. As a Gen Xer, I really appreciate this message. The instrumental uh, nuttiness here is this like guitar solo of like downshifting, like woo, 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 woo. But that's like the second nutty instrumental bit, like the real, I don't know, there's so many great instrumental bits here. This is what I'm talking about. There's a piano thing in the middle of this that sounds like a, this is very tasteful, sounds like a little classical piano thing. And there's nothing classical about the song classical. The song classical had a crazy saxophone that sounded like jazz nut jobs, right? And there's even like a very kind of Weezer-like bit here where it changes what instruments are being played and re repeat of the chorus. It repeats a lot of all the music, of all the lyrics, I find these the least interesting. It's maybe over repetitive. Again, this is like maybe the worst song, but like it's a great song. <laughs> I really like it. I wouldn't skip it. I wouldn't, I would not even come close to skipping it, but maybe the least interesting song on the album. Next track is called Connect, which if you pair the way he says, is it so strange? I can't connect with the song Thank You by Dido, memorably sampled by Eminem and the song Stan. I think it would pair really well. This has a nice kind of tickling classical piano here, again, following through from the previous song. Not much sustain on the piano, which is nice. And then it becomes like jazz with like a stand-up bass -doo 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 -doo, and drums. And then it settles into almost like a four on the floor techno beat. And then it becomes almost like a pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up, pick it up style, ska style drums, which reminded me of A-Track, A-Punk. <laughs> Did I say a pone? You get extra sky points if you can tell me in the comments what what is a pone. Okay? Still that shit. Almost like jazz singing in the pre-chorus. Very kind of like freak out, weird chorus. Like it has this like voice changer underneath, like psychedelic and weird. Like what's going on with this song? It's so awesome. It's so different, but it fits in so well with the rest of the album. When the piano comes back, it plays something which reminded me strongly of the Lost Woods theme from Zelda. Bum, bum, bum. Then the instrumental nuttiness, just left and right channel, these piano nuts, uh, notes that are just like plodding and just all these echoes and all this building and this outro and this it's not actually an outro and like these up and down scales. And then it's like the pianos sound like they're chopped for a loop for a hip hop beat, but they're not chopped for a loop for a hip hop beat. They're chopped for artistic effect in the middle of a song that could just have a normal piano part. It's really cool. There's a lot of very cool avant-garde production going on here. Um, is it strange I can't connect? It isn't strange, but I could check, walked around to where we first met the first time and overwhelmed. I know once it's lost, it's never found. I need it now. The grid is buried in the ground, hopelessly down. I think, I think this fits in that general theme of where we're talking about connectivity in the modern world and uh, the world of the past decade and where we are. Then we get to the song Prep School Gangsters. Oh my God. I have so much to say about this album. Single strat notes, kind of a little riff. It's almost nothing, but they build it into something by adding more guitars. Nice restrained piano. There's this call and response at the end that that's the instrumental nuttiness between the, 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 the violin and the guitar. Man, she's really going through it right now. Ah, uh, you know what? It sounds like she's gonna come upstairs to change her diaper. It. If you need to change your diaper, it's okay. Nah, she can't hear me. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll keep going. I might have to pause and edit this video. We'll see. Um, so, you know, there's great, like, back and forth with the violin and the guitar. Again, the violin reminds me a lot of Andrew Bird. Nice outro. Has this full horn feel. The vocal production is often, like, this great harmonies. Like, you know, somewhere in your family tree, there was somebody just like me. This beautiful line that's sung almost with like Paul Simon style exuberance. And then let's talk about the lyrics, okay? Prep school gangsters. I have a lot to say. First of all, um, I live in a nice suburb, okay? 
So, I mean, it's in Western New York, so we're not talking Greenwich, okay? It's still an, an, a, it is still a relatively affordable suburb for America, right? Um, but it's got one of the better school systems uh, in the state, right? That's why I live here. That's where she's going to be growing up. <laughs> um, and <laughs> is this too stressful for you? Is it too stressful to have the baby screaming in the background? I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go check. You hang out and think about this album. I'm going to go check and see what's up. Hey, would it help if I stopped? I'm still recording, but... No, she, she doesn't need anything up here or nothing? No. All right, well, I'm, I'm like halfway through. I'm more than halfway through. Okay. All right, I'm going to go back. I hope that gave you time to smash the like bucket. So it's a very good school system where, where, my, uh, where my kids go to school. And my son explained to me the way that the drug trade works. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. First of all, I'm psyched that I had a son who could explain these things to me. And I'm not going to say any names because <laughs> I'm not a narc. But like, I knew most of the kids who he was talking about because you know, I used to coach them in Little League and stuff. And like they would legitimately go into like the parts of new uh, the parts of Rochester where like you know our ex nephew would rap about and literally go and buy drugs from lower class and uh, people in the city and then bring them out to the suburbs and distribute them to the more affluent people in our town and that's like apparently a New York a, a New York magazine article was called prep school gangsters about this kind of thing about rich people becoming drug dealers and then taking on the persona of gangsters and that's the thing like these friends of my son or the people who my son knew they're sitting there and they're like reconfiguring vapes and they're selling all sorts of crazy stuff and like they think they're gangsters they think they're chief keef they do they think they've got a plug and they're just it's wild but that's not actually the point i don't think i think it's actually about the prep school gangsters who rule the world okay talking like remember that guy brett kavanaugh that guy he is a symptom, but he is the sickness, okay? He is the guy who came from incalculable privilege and turned that privilege into suffering for other people at his own benefit, okay? That is the smiling, snarling face. Tucker Carlson is the face of prep school gangsterism, okay? This kind of power and somehow getting other people to buy into it and think that it's cool. I went to prep school for two years, middle school. I had a, I had a very rough middle school. So like, um, I just couldn't be there anymore. And my parents sent me to, to, a, to a private school, uh, Belmont Hill School for boys, and future sadists. Uh, all boys school, very kind of regimented, had to wear a suit and tie every day, all that stuff. I ended up leaving there after two years because people teased me too bad because I had long hair and they called me muffin head. Uh, but it's interesting because I, I do remember. I remember seeing this start to happen. I remember, even though I left after eighth grade, I remember seeing these kids who were like wearing Los Angeles Raiders hats and referring to themselves as like, you know, crackers with attitude. And I remember them starting to get those drugs and sell them. Like, this is a real thing. But those kids, those kids who kept going to that school, I'm sure some of them are very nice. Some are probably working for NGOs. Some of them are probably just bankers, but not the worst people on planet Earth. But we do live in a system. But the thing that's interesting is if I went back to that school now, the wealth gap is that they're different kinds of rich kids now. You know, my, my son did a summer program and he described it to me and he's even at a college now. And it's like the rich kids now because of the wealth gap are so far from everyone else that like, I don't know, it's fascinating. It's fascinating and they're talking about it and they should talk about it and they can talk about it. Next track is called The Surfer. Uh, a little bit less flashy. It's nice, kind of a downbeat song here. Simple drum line, cool bass and percussion. Some lyrics that appear to be about like the city. Oh, surfer, we can't forget the shells around his neck, but you were born beneath fluorescent lights. You've never seen a starry night. It's got this kind of cool, like sad feeling. <laughs> Jesus I Seriously, she has never cried this much. Uh-oh, she just said, uh-oh. <laughs> Maybe it's because of the, the, the eclipse. Maybe it, maybe it makes babies crazy. 
I do have an unexpected pairing though for this song. Are you ready? Protect Your Neck by Wu-Tang. The bass on this song, there's a certain point. So the, the way that the bass works is if we go, you know, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. And the bass on Protect Your Neck is on the end after one. Doom, doom, right? This is kind of weird stilted bass. This does the same bass placement. Goofs around the piano, super gentle and cool. I, I lost a little bit of track of the song because the first time I listened to it carefully, I got lost in that movie, The Ruins. I got to the part where they touched the ivy. Uh, the instrumental nuttiness is this cool, like, on this trumpet, these really art, like emphatic sounds. And then like a, like a George Harrison style slide guitar solo and a Ringo style drum fill. It's just beautiful. And then at the very end, this gets this cool jam that reminds me strongly and positively of Isaac Hayes. And if you don't know Isaac Hayes, someone I hold in the highest esteem, okay? When it comes to S-tier musicians, Isaac Hayes is one of like 10 S-tier musicians, in my opinion, okay? So just when I say it reminds me of Isaac Hayes, I'm not saying that like, oh, just whatever, some guy, right? Like I'm saying... And like, I'm saying like Marvin Gaye is S tier, is A tier compared to Isaac Hayes. That's how high I hold Isaac Hayes. So. Gen X cops, that's me, I'm Gen X. I like, I like they talked about generations. I like, it. it's interesting, cool kind of scattered up, you know, fast beat. And what I like about this is this song sounds like a surf song. So the last song was called Surf and it sounds like a surf song, they're fun. Kind of like a drums and bass and voice, kind of cute voice rising. Um, nice guitar solo, just like the hook from the beginning, but play it again. The instrumental nuttiness is again, a choppy piano solo, just really, really awesome and tasteful. I think the bass is being played with a pick, which is very noticeable, a very gorgeous cello sneaks in here. And this appears to be about the general feeling of home ownership <laughs> and the wealth gap and inflation. Black in the sky and sharp in the axe, forever cursed to live unrelaxed. We make no bones, a house is not a home, and a home is nowhere we can stay. Dodge the draft, but can't dodge the war, forever cursed to live insecure. The curtain drops, a gang of Gen X cops assembles, trembling before our human nature. So, it's an interesting idea, because uh, I don't think it's actually like saying Gen X in particular is at fault here because the end of the song and the thing that's repeated is every generation makes its own apology. And that's where we are, that every generation, there's no such thing as a good generation. There isn't. Millennials aren't good. Zoomers aren't good. Xers aren't good. Boomers aren't good. Greatest generation isn't good. None of it's good. We're all just human beings, but we all make different kinds of mistakes and have different kinds of privileges and different kinds of drawbacks. And this appears to be a song about that and about that sense of insecurity that now exists for many millennials as they are trying to become adults. But dude, I mean, no, you know what? It's fair. We didn't have it as good as our parents, but we have it better than our kids. Mary Boone... What a beautiful song. It like, starts with this high singing, a little bit of distortion. This bass comes in gently. This weird choir on these quarter notes. Rosemary's Baby is a very New York movie that I really enjoy. And for some reason, the choir here reminds me a little bit of Rosemary's Baby. And this, obviously, when these drums come in, has a perfect pairing. Now, I'm going to compare it to the song by Primitive Radio Gods, Standing Outside a Broken Phone Booth with Money in My Hands. Most Generation X title of a song you could possibly write. Standing outside a broken phone booth with money in my hand. It's not just that they also sample Back to Life remix by Soul to Soul with the drum uh, sample that comes in here. It's actually before then when you hear the bass. Do, 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 do. If you don't know the song, Standing Outside a Broken Phone Booth with Money in My Hand by Primitive Radio Gods, do yourself the service, do yourself the favor of listening to it immediately. I feel like such an ass because I didn't buy their album when it came out. Who doesn't love this song? But I just thought as a one-hit wonder. They might be a great band. I don't know. But the way they mix in B.B. Uh, King on their original song, uh, on their song from the 90s. I've been downhearted, baby. I've been, down, I've been downhearted, baby. Ever since the day we left. Ever since the day we met. My job for you. This is... My, I don't know. This video is only going to get like 5,000 views if I'm lucky. Probably just three. 
which is great. Never thought I'd be this successful. But I want to make a real impact. And I want Vampire Weekend fans to whenever they play this song in the stadium, I want all 4,000, 10,000 people in the stadium to start singing. I've been down hearted, baby. I've been down, I've been down hearted, baby. Ever since the day we met. Because it fits in perfectly. I'm positive they're influenced by this. And it's great. And the instrumental nuttiness is when this piano trills over this section in the choral there. Apparently Mary Boone was a art dealer in New York and it's kind of about the old New York and the new New York. And it used to be that, that New York City, especially Manhattan, was like a place for artists. And now it's a place for investment bankers. So there you go. Uh, the penultimate track is Pravda, kind of a, again, with a noodly half asked African style guitar that I associate with them, but it cuts out beautiful rhythms. Seems to be a lot about like maybe an immigrant coming to New York talking about the, the Russian newspaper Pravda, which means truth. They always ask me about Pravda, it's just the Russian word for truth. Your consciousness is not my problem because when I get, when I come home, it won't be home to you. Your consciousness is not my problem is the other line that, that Andrew Bird heard it and was like, you know, he's sitting there drinking his coffee and spit it out and started whistling, going, <whistles> playing the violin, saying, I wish I wrote that because that's exactly that kind of line. Beautiful guitar and bongo outro. It sort of reminds me of the Almond Brothers, just like the level of precision that we have with this. So that's, that's my review. I absolutely love this album. Uh, these are my Patreons and they help me to buy music. Hey, do you hear that? My baby's okay. I'm going to go down and hang out with her and check out the eclipse. It's super, super cloudy here. Well, it's getting a little bit brighter. They helped me to buy music. And so I bought this. I bought Chicano Batman. I bought Fleetwood Mac um, for my family because we listen to this music and we love it. And they helped me do that. While being able to buy diapers for that baby down there, I'm also able to buy music and support these artists. I do a special thing where I allow or I just do call-outs. Who would like a shout-out at the end of this? And you don't have to be on the special paper. You can be on the on the EP paper, you know? You don't have to spend a lot. I just ask. So Sis the World, Dave Dinesh, Zach, and Ethan Jorge, or Ethan George, I don't know which one, they all want to get a special shout-out because they like... Vampire Weekend that much. So you can tell me in the comments, what am I missing from Vampire Weekend? What are the essential things that I need to know? What do you think of this album? What did I miss? And uh, I, I promise my baby is, is a very happy, well cared for baby, in case you're nervous. Like, she's, she's very, uh, very cherished. All right, until next time. Uh, I hope you let it go. There's the camera.